Hi, and welcome to episode five of Metastatic Modernity. I'm Tom Murphy, and this episode is in our, on our biological inheritance as humans. It's a bit of an extension of episode three on early life, and it's our next step in putting modernity into context. I'm going to start with a recognition that we have invented a lot of very nifty and clever things and fancy ourselves masters of innovation, which to an extent is true. But I want to compare our inventions to the inventions of life by asking a few questions. Can our inventions work for 10,000 years, which is short on a time scale of evolution and ecology and species? Can our inventions repair themselves if they get damaged, like we can repair wounds or get better after a sickness, or some animals can regrow tails and limbs, and plants are masters of self-repair. They're doing it all the time. Can our inventions self-replicate and, in fact, figure out ways to do a better job and have spontaneous upgrades along the way? Can they recycle themselves fully so that they don't require any new materials from the ground? They are completely using the few elements that are in wide circulation in the community of life. And can our inventions fully integrate into an ecological context, which if that is confusing, that's part of why we're doing this series. It's not a question we often ask. So as we mentioned in episode three, there are a lot of problems that early life solved, like replication and DNA and RNA cells and cell membranes and metabolism and waste disposal. But later creatures developed things like bones and muscle and tendons and skin. Neurons have been around for 500 million years or so. Sex is not something we invented. And so we have benefited from a lot of these things. And then when it comes to the senses, the five senses that we know well and recognize, which is not, by the way, a complete set, we have touch and sight and smell and hearing and taste. And we're not even the best at any of these things, but we have additional things like sonar that bats can use that we're not uh, able to do ourselves. And then feats like running and flying and swimming and dexterity. And missing from this list is photosynthesis, which is really amazing to be able to eat sunlight. We can't do anything nearly as cool as that. Um, as an aside, when I was putting the slide together, I wanted a picture of an animal running, and I thought about a lizard running on hind legs, which is pretty fun and cute. Um, even on top of water, they can do that. And so in the process, I did a Google search for uh, these three words, evolution running animal. And I got the results were very anthropocentric, and I want to encourage you to try it and see what you get. Um, just a, a, a little interesting window. So like we said in episode three, the microbes have done a lot for us and solved a lot of the hard problems. And then the plants and animals that followed continue to build up solutions. And in a way, they're just real geniuses. I mean, pretty amazing. They've solved our hardest problems in a very complex world. We haven't really even figured out yet how it all works. And so they're ahead of us and we're playing catch up. And I'll remind you that out of an amoeba's 13,000 genes compared to our 20,000, it's not dramatically different, we share a third of an amoeba's genes. So we're heavily reliant on that very early uh, set of solutions. And we're really 99% heritage. We've just added a few little things on top of it. Even our brains are largely inherited with a few little upgrades that have been important, but still mostly inherited. So I call these microbes, plants, and animals geniuses um, because they have solved all these hard problems and they're not really confused about how to live on this planet. That seems to be something we're very good at. Um, some people might say, well, gosh, those things don't really know what they're doing. They just are bumbling around and fell into these things. They didn't, you can't say they solved the problems. They didn't understand what they're doing. In a way, I mean, I understand that, that reaction, but it's a bit of self-flattery in saying if they don't do it the way we would have done it, then it doesn't count. If it didn't involve brains, it doesn't count. And I just want to point out that we can't do anything nearly as cool with our brains. We've never done anything nearly as cool so uh, and amazing and robust. So the solutions that are out there in nature are real. They are robust. They're elegant. They're clever. They've lasted a long time. Uh, who cares if neurons were involved? That 
why would that be the metric? It's still really amazing, really genius. And in fact, maybe even more genius because it's in a way that we can't even conceive. It's, it's a, a way to solve problems that's utterly unfamiliar to us. So uh, the fact that it all works is amazing. I have more to say about brains and how they relate to this topic. I don't want to get too far afield in this short video, but the companion piece does have more thoughts on brains and how we view them and what they can and can't do. So I'll leave it there for now. Next time, we're going to look at the accidental tourist nature of humans as being just happened to be here. And in the meantime, I encourage you to look at the companion piece on for all these videos, pieces for all these videos um, that are more complete, polished, and thoughtful at do the math. Uh, UCSD.edu. Okay, that's it.